Hello. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are starting this evening's event. Shall we please be on our feet? past presidents of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, vice presidents, fellows of the Ghana Academy, honorable ministers, members of parliament, your excellencies, distinguished guests, students, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Now on behalf of the president and fellows of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, I warmly welcome you to this evening's event on a roundtable panel discussion on the theme, Ghana's current security challenges. At this point, I would like to introduce the chairman for this evening's event, who will take over from me and introduce the speaker. The chairman for this occasion is Professor Henrietta Joy Abena Nyakun Mensabonsu. She is a professor of law, immediate past director of the Ligon Center for International Affairs and Diplomacy, and former Deputy Special Representative, Rule of Law to the United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon for Liberia. And she is the current president of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences. Audience, audience, your chairman, chairman, your audience. Thank you. Past presidents of the Academy, vice presidents of the Academy, distinguished fellows of the Academy, distinguished invited guests, senior service officers, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure the students are also covered nicely by the gentleman tag, unless you want to dispute that you are gentlemen. Welcome and good evening to you all. This evening, we have met to discuss a topic that is dear to the hearts of all who want the welfare of our country. Ghana is not an island. And not being an island, there are issues within it and around it that give cause for concern. The academy has been used to discussing all manner of things, except our current security challenges. In 1994, 
there were proceedings on security. But in those days, we worried about other people and not about us. It was too far away from us. So in a distant sort of way, we, we solidarized with people. Unfortunately, those times are long past. Many years ago in the early 80s, somebody told me that every African is a potential refugee. And so we should order our affairs accordingly. I thought he was being facetious. And I said, oh no, it's in Southern Africa and parts of East Africa that there are problems. Not now and again, a little flashing way. We West Africans are not like that. Was my very naive conclusion. But uh, fast forward to 2019, and I'm sure I won't say the same things ever, ever, ever again. So today we have met to discuss these very important topics. We have put together a panel, a distinguished panel. There is enough energy on security on this table to light the room. And so we will be taking their presentations. They each have prepared a short presentation. We've agreed that the public might also want to pitch in and have a, a discussion. And so we are going to limit the time for their presentation. We have agreed that they will do a 10 to 15 minute, maximum 15, and then I will crack the whip so that we can uh, finish the presentations. That will take us more than an hour because there are seven presentations. And then we will have the public pitching and together we will all be enlightened. And so I have also told them that I will introduce each of them in one sentence. Since the bios are provided, one sentence, and that should be enough. It has been said that the more important you are, the shorter your introduction. So I don't want to diminish their importance by a long introduction. And so the first speaker, Brigadier General Dr. Emmanuel Kotia, he is going to give a presentation on the overview of current security challenges in the world. We want to start from the world because unfortunately now the world is a very small place. Brigadier General Dr. Kwetia is on secondment from the Ghana Armed Forces to the National Border Commission of Ghana. And he has been on a number of UN peacekeeping missions. So he can tell you at first and some of the issues that we, we face at this time. Dr. Kutia. Thank you, Madam Chair, Professor. Members of the Council of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, fellow panelists, I've seen some generals and very senior military officers and members of the security agencies around. Um, I've also seen some, I need to mention this because I'm in uniform, defense advisors from the America and the British High Commission here, friends, and some students around. Emeritus professors and professors present here. You would agree with me that my topic is very wide. And uh, in doing this within 15 minutes, it's really going to be a challenge, but I'll try my best as the professor has directed. The world has experienced um, various levels of security challenges since the end of the Cold War. The retrogressive 
and destructive effects of insecurity on development has garnered the well-being of states and their populations have been more evident than before. Now, the state of civil conflicts in particular and the populations wrong, the state of civil conflicts in particular has characterized the world in recent times and this has led to an alarming high risk of death, poverty and disease that are still prevalent across the world. One cannot separate global security issues from development and the general living conditions of the populations in the world, for that matter. This is because insecurity by its very nature disrupts states and prevents the achievements of developmental programs, but also because when countries are confronted with security concerns, attention to the needs of the people and the development programs becomes secondary in that matter. Therefore, I need to mention and state that security is a very important aspect of our life because without security, we can never develop. And without development, we can never be able to provide for the living conditions of the people in any country. There is therefore this interrelated factors, security, development, and the well-being of the people. And let me state clearly that where we have seen insecurity, even within a small secular communities, within our own country or any other country, it disrupts development and for that matter, the living conditions of the people. I will try as much as possible to discuss briefly um, the concept of security, just briefly because of the time. I would uh, try as much as possible to look at a con contemporary con a civil complex, terrorism as an emerging global threat. I have realized that there's somebody speaking on cyber, so I'll just briefly highlight on it and make proposals on addressing global security challenges and then draw some conclusions. The concept of security, unfortunately, my headings are not coming. I don't know why. They're loading. The headings are not coming. The concept of security describes the plan approach for achieving a country or an institution stipulated security objectives. Bosden asserts that the concept of security covers a variety of interconnected issues. This ranges from traditional, conventional modes of military power, causes and consequences of war between states and ethnic, religious, ideological conflicts, trade and economic conflicts, energy supply, science, technology, food and well-being. That is invariable human security in this sector and the activities of, and I want to emphasize, non-state actors. That is very key. The security of any state, according to Al Rodan, cannot therefore be achieved without good governance at all levels that guarantees security through justice for all individuals. The concept of security therefore lays the theoretical foundation for the discussions on the current challenges in the world. Rodan Finally, Rhoda assesses that in a globalized world, security can no longer be the responsibility of nation states alone. Global security instead has five dimensions that include human, envir human, in human environment, national, and transitional, and culture. Okay. Transnational and transcultural security. Let's then look at what are the security challenges after on giving this conceptual foundation. Now, first of all, let's look at uh, civil conflicts. Um, civil conflicts continue to be a frequent phenomenon in international politics. Of approximately 200 countries in the world, there are over 20 civil conflicts on the way. Many of these conflicts unfolding in states with limited capacities to respond to and mitigate on security consequences that emanate from internal violence and state disorder. Almost all these consequences in one form or another are the sources of immense human suffering and regional uh, instability. Modern civil conflicts are not only associated with historical dynamics 
ethnopolitical tensions, rebel activities, and armed resistance to authoritarian rule remain the major sources of civil interstate conflicts, interstate conflicts in the world. The one force and emerging civil conflict worldwide is no state actors, as I mentioned much earlier when I was making uh, the introduction based on the, con uh, the, the conceptual framework. They serve as catalysts for most emerging civil conflicts globally. The Syria civil conflict emerged from the state of regression of a popular uprising with heavy sectarian undertones based on the exclusion of the majority from power and wealth of the country's rulers. In Mali, recent armed crisis is as a result of rebellion by Turks and who are demanding for the creation of a new country. The civil conflicts raging in South Sudan, Iraq, Central African Republic, Yemen, Democratic Republic of Congo, and Libya started as a result of armed competition for power and resources between various actors, largely by sectarian, ethnic, and religious factions. Most of the grievances for such civil conflicts stem from acute sense of exclusion in one way or the other. Now, let's look at the framework for contemporary conflicts. Interstates, intrastate conflicts. We are now basically most of the civil conflicts are based on conflicts within the state and protagonists within the state. Probably they may even have come out, but it is between either the state, non state actors, or among state actors. In some cases, sub state actors. By definition of state actors, sub state actors, if they are non state actors and they have ter the whole territory, then they become sub state actors in that regard. The regional clinic of patterns, cross-border and social demographics are also issues that we must think about. The Sahel conflict comes to mind in that this regard. The conflict in the Democratic Republic of Congo is one. The Syria, Iraqi, Turkey enclave of conflicts is one. And the Yemen, Saudi conflicts, that, is, that keeps raging is also another example in that. What are the state dynamics so far the framework is concerned? We have a social, uh, so, the, the, so, the, we have a socially weak society cultural divisions and ethnic imbalance, so far as some of these dynamics are concerned. We also, they are also associated with economic weak, econ uh, economic weak, a weak economy, poor resource base, relative deprivation of the people, political weak polity, partisan government, regime illegitimacy in that regard. Now what then are the features of contemporary civil conflicts? Uh, they are characterized by various transactional connections. State failure, it is associated with phase state failure caused by micro societal and economic factors such as democratic pressures. We have mass movement of refugees that creates a conflict situation so far as the environment and states are concerned. We have economic decline and we have seen examples of economic decline in Liberia during that conflict. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, it is, it is, uh, it is still on in Iraq. And Yemen, we've seen that these things have happened. And then at the same time, we realize that people have made themselves as warlords, leaders of some of these non-state actors who are using, this, uh, so far as the state, the state's the economy is declining, but they are rather appropriating wealth to themselves. The loss of uh, the criminalization of the state is also one other uh, feature. The loss of monopoly of living the use of force, especially by non-state actors, Violations of human rights and the rise of paramilitary groups and private armies, and this is associated with extreme fragmentation of armed groups. This has led to the manipulation of forms. Ethnic and religion become more important than political factors like ideology. And this is very relevant so far as the Central African Republic is concerned. Victims of modern conflicts and many others that we can think about. There is a blurred a distinction between, between public and private uh, combatants. Now, having been given the time that I'm left five minutes to go, let's just quickly look at uh, terrorism. <laughs> In this, uh, I thought I would have been forgiven to be given an additional five minutes because of the white this thing, uh, topic. Now, I'm just going to look at terrorism. I will clearly say that ter terrorism is a premeditated use of threat to use violence against non combatants by sub national groups. Now, clearly, it threatens the fundamental of the nation's law and order and human rights, and it's an enemy to mankind in that regard. Uh, acts of terrorism are motivated by two things, social and uh, political 
social and political injustice. People choose terrorism when they are trying to change what they perceive to be social. Example, when they have been stripped of their land and rights and denied their rights. Secondly, they believe that violence is, or is threat will be effective to usher in change. They believe that violence means justify ends. Many terrorists in history say sincerely, they choose violence after a long deprivation because they felt that they had no choice. Invariably, these are the drivers of terrorism, lack of social and economic opportunity, marginalization and discrimination, poor governance, religious fanatism. Let's remember the Sharia law issue related to uh, Boko Haram in Nigeria. Now, what are then the security dimensions, impact of security, uh, impact based on security dimensions of terrorism? Indiscriminate killing, armed civilian, uh, uh, unarmed civilians, arson, kidnappings, the Kibo girls in Nigeria is an example, social disharmony, lack of departmental and social improvement of the people, it deepens poverty and unemployment, destabilizes democratically elected governments in the world. Here is the most important aspect of it. The impact on economic and business dimension, and that is very key so far as a developing country like uh, developing countries are concerned, and the world at large. Attacks may enhance uncertainty, which limits investments. It augments security outlays. Terrorist campaigns see the rise of cost of doing business through higher wages, large margins of insurance premiums, because when there is conflict going on, insurance will go high, insurance of aircraft will go high, so it even increases the uh, air, uh, the uh, Affairs for airlines, premiums, and greater security expenditure so far as that incident is concerned. Attacks may dampen the group by destroying and degrading social overhead capital that facilitates commerce daily. Serial there may be serious impacts on the specific industry, especially on the airline business, as I mentioned, on ter terrorism, which may limit growth. They may cause donor countries to curtail foreign assistance owing to security concerns. Now, I mentioned that somebody is going to take terrorism but let me briefly say that the causes the main causes of cyber crime are economic motivated cyber crime that is basically dealing with economics of it if i get myself involved in cyber issues what am i going to gain out of it it is economic benefit the economic benefit of it personally motivated like an individual who thinks that personally he is going to get something out of it cyber criminals are still human beings and what they do, including their crime, is often the cause of personal emotions and vendettas. And then we, have, we can look at ideological motivated cyber. These are kinds of cyber attacks that are conducted for perceived ethical, uh, ideological, or moral reasons. And then the structural causes, these go beyond the causes that motivate criminals, the environment in which cyber crime is committed and also saves. Now, let us look finally, let us look at the how we can address global challenges. Uh, this is just my concluding bit so far as the presentation is concerned. <laughs> so, <laughs> Professor Chair will forgive me to complete with this. <laughs> Addressing the global challenges of security, sustainable capacity building and improvement, um, is, uh, improvement with new security approaches for the responsibility and protection of monitoring is key so far as uh, 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 security is concerned. In addition, the police, the judiciary, and the prisons are enforcement bodies which must be strengthened to prosecute, sentence, and many criminals when they are apprehended, based on the various dimensions of security that probably one can think about. Building the capacity of the legislature is necessary for passing the appropriate national legislations to deal with emerging security threats. Constant reviews of country of countries, continental and regional policies or frameworks on society, coordinated and well-structured intelligence on the continental and regional security architectures could also save the world from security challenges uh, uh, confronting the world. And then security agencies can only function efficiently when there is good governance. Good governance leads to transparency and accountability. This gives assurance that corruption is minimized in the views of the minorities are taken into account and that the voices of most of the vulnerable in society are heard in decision making. Populations need to be aware to join efforts of the security agents to aid through monitoring and suspected cases of violence. Civil society organizations, non-governmental organizations, think tanks, whistleblower institutions need to be encouraged to aid traditional security institutions in the fight against emerging security threats. And finally, 
we need a vibrant and open press and the existence of a proactive not just the existence of the civil society organization but they must be proactive we have experiences of civil society organizations that are just in existence but they must be proactive may serve as a source of education for the population using their advocacy rule in conclusion uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen i have tried my best within the limited period that i have to look at civil conflicts to be able to give some dimensions so far as terrorism is concerned and then briefly to look at uh, cyber threats so far as our uh, the world the security in the world is concerned what is very clear is that we need some mitigating measures to be able to address these issues individual countries must come out with security policies that will help address these policies the various sections there may be various they must have strategies for various things. for instance we must have a counter-terrorism strategy or framework we must have a strategy for cyber crime and we must have a strategy for internal conflicts or a policing policy in that regard we must have a border security policy crafted by national immigration i've seen the immigration gurus around so in 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 in, in, in summary this is the end and i think that we will <laughs> Thank you very much, Doc. I know you have a lot to say. And the reason we are cutting the time is so that members of the public can ask questions. So I'm certain that you will have the opportunity to um, use some of the information that you have gathered for our benefit. We are very appreciative. Now, having looked at the uh, trajectory of the discussion, it seems to me that we should finish with the international aspects so that when we come to the domestic aspect, we don't stray and go back. And so I'm using the prerogative of the chair to rearrange the order of the lectures. I have already sought the permission of the speakers, so don't raise that as an excuse. And so the second speaker will be Colonel Festus Abwaji, Colonel retired, one of the leading lights of uh, security in this country, foremost author, you name it. I will not um, use up the soup while the fufu is being pounded. So Colonel, your audience. Madam Chair and Madam Professor, let me stand on the existing protocol uh, for want of time to recognize all and sundry here gathered. Whilst we're waiting for them to upload or load my presentation, okay, thank you. Can, can you enlarge it a bit to the extent possible? Our next topic has to do with the insecurities perceived to be existing in our neighboring um, member states. I'll be trying to 
more or less introduce a 20-page paper that we were required to present. But because of the further restriction of time, I might not be able to transition a bit smoothly from slide to slide, but I'll do my best. Um, first of all, the state of insecurity in West Africa has the backdrop of the armed conflicts that the region went through, or sub-region, in the late 90s, late 80s, up to the early 2000s. And these conflicts continue to have implications for security within the sub-region. So when you have the opportunity to read the paper, it basically seeks to highlight the insecurities, Cote d'Ivoire to the west, Burkina Faso to the north, and Togo to the east. But I've decided that the maritime space of Ghana is also a polity in quotes, if that is acceptable politically speaking, that we need to be uh, mindful of. And I make very broad recommendations for policy consideration and further uh, research. In the context of what General Kotia said, there are two main domains of insecurity. The traditional threats, emanating from traditional threats, and the so-called, as I call it, the emerging security threats. I will not belabor you by going through the plethora of the constituents of these types of uh, insecurities. But it's very important that in the context of West Africa, and particularly the four countries at stake here, including Ghana, a lot of the insecurities emanate from structural vulnerabilities around weak border control uh, systems, governance deficits, weak criminal justice systems, and the rule of law bordering on good governance or the deficit thereof. Existence of unmanageable security threats attributable um, to persistent state weakness and weak continental and sub-regional governance uh, architectures. Lastly, the lack of institutional capacity within the institutions of these countries to manage these threats. So let's start with Cote d'Ivoire. <clears throat> As a summary, Cote d'Ivoire, since it's, let's call it a civil war, emanating from the disputed elections late 2010 into 2011, has made considerable progress. But there is evidence from a number of sources that Cote d'Ivoire is yet to consolidate durable peace. And that must be a source of some concern uh, for the country. The areas of Cote d'Ivoire's internal insecurities revolve around traditional justice, transitional justice, that has not been implemented in the way that the president himself promised when he assumed the reins of power. And in addition to transitional justice, the lack of reparations uh, for the victims of the conflict. Probably the most disturbing aspect is the idea that although both sides, that is Watare's side and Gbagbo's side, were involved in human rights abuses, for some strange reason, Watara has chosen only to deal with Gbagbo's uh, supporters and not address you know, elements within his own uh, you know, domain. So I'll jump over all of these and go to the next topic, which is the uncontrolled security sector. President Alassane Ouattara has found it difficult to implement a constructive, effective security sector reform and to govern that security sector as effectively as required in order to stabilize uh, Cote d'Ivoire. So there are a lot of small arms, and I think uh, Dr. Festus Solvin uh, will be speaking to that. 
both heavy and small arms that are running around. And I wouldn't be surprised that from his research, some of these weapons are finding their way into uh, Ghana. The National Defense Forces, the FRCI, you know, is also an authority unto itself. And this, from certain sources that have indicated, including CIA and so on, is involved in the exploitation and illegal smuggling of all sorts of natural resources, including diamond and so on and so forth. Cote d'Ivoire has had one episode of uh, terrorism in March of 2016 in the Grand Bassam Hotel. Subsequently, it has found some resilience to hold terrorism at bay. The impression that I get, or the sense I get, is that although Cote d'Ivoire might have been able to contain the spread of terrorism within its borders, the impact of terrorism elsewhere, especially in Burkina Faso, may probably set Cote d'Ivoire back uh, if certain measures are not put in place. I'm also thinking, just as an ordinary person, that although we have found an amicable settlement of the maritime dispute between Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, there could be elements, both political and otherwise, within the Ivorian society that may not be happy with a settlement. And who could exploit you know, those grievances or that grievance uh, to destabilize the, the country with implications for Ghana? In terms of political security, there is a lot of increasing tension between different political actors in Cote d'Ivoire. And I think three slides speak to that. So these four major actors, excluding Bagbo, who is on parole somewhere in Europe, Blegude with Bagbo, uh, the president Ouattara, um, our good old father, Conan Bedier, you know, are still jostling for power, especially in the run-up to the 2020 elections, I think it's in October. And I'm told, or I've read, that some of them are forming alliances with Babos, you know, party. And we need to be very worried because Cote d'Ivoire's elections come only a few weeks from October to December before we have our own elections, and there could be implications for us. So in summary, I gather that if there is serious instability in Cote d'Ivoire, there could be implications of cross-border terrorist attacks because there might be some gaps within the security architecture in Cote d'Ivoire that could be exploited by terrorists not only against Cote d'Ivoire, but also against uh, Ghana. There could be illegal immigration and refugees outflows into Ghana, and that could compound you know, the illegal flows of weapons and ammunition and terrorists and so on. But of course, that could also engender some small arms um, trafficking and so on and so forth. Now let's go to Burkina Faso. As we speak, the most serious concern emanating from Cote d'Ivoire is terrorism. Terrorism and sociopolitical unrest within Cote d'Ivoire with a mixture of violent extremism and terrorism um, are the most imminent uh, threats. And I think General Kotia has spoken to that. I believe other speakers might touch on the element of violent extremism and terrorism and so on and so forth. The whole concern emanates from the speed, the rate at which the terrorists are gaining control of vast territories within Cote d'Ivoire. Now, of, of Burkina Faso, now almost in political science terms, echoing of the northern borders of this country. Of course, the authorities will tell us that there is nothing at stake. We don't need to worry. But from an analytical perspective, the proximity of terrorism close to any border is a source of worry. 
This picture by the African Center for Strategic uh, Studies gives you a sense. I'm sorry that the border lines don't show properly. But there are elements that other speakers will talk about. I believe uh, Dr. Fessu Sorbin and co. And these five terrorist groups that are creating a lot of havoc, havoc within uh, Burkina Faso. The implications for Ghana's own security will be that the instability as it increases will not only trigger, but will also, you know, complicate refugee flows, you know, into our country. And any refugee flows would also come with inflows of terrorists and weapons and ammunition and so on and so forth. The increased radicalism could also be a cause for concern for Ghana as these violent extremists come to our borders and probably infiltrate um, our borders. We we'll have difficulty policing certain ungoverned spaces. And indeed, as we speak, there are certain places in Ghana, especially in the north, that the state is absent. Uh, it's not my topic, so I wouldn't uh, want to bother it to that. Small arms trafficking might increase illegal immigration refugee outflows and the threat of food insecurity as populations are dis uh, displaced within the northern parts of Ghana. But let's quickly look at Togo. Togo's most significant stability issue or instability issue emanates from a combination of its politics and demographics. The country, as we all know, should know, has a history of political repression by the Northern Kabye ethnic group against, you know, the other ethnic groups, especially the airways uh, to the south. It also has a history of political repression, especially of the uh, opposition. And there are tensions around constitutional reform, including Togo's ignorance or ignoring, rejecting the ECOWAS arrangements that have been put in place to limit presidential terms to two. Now, Togo, contrary to many other West African states, had thrown caution uh, to the wind. And therefore, Junior Eyadema, you know, has become a virtual uh, uh, legal dictator. And Togo is risking becoming a virtual one-party dominant state system. These will have implications for the likelihood of refugees once again, uh, worsen Togo's own status as a transit hub for narco trafficking, as reported by the CIA, increase in the temptation to use or exploit the Western Togoland question that currently confronts Ghana. And I say this because I was in the army in 1977 when we deployed a certain exercise called Trojan Horse in the Volta region to try and demonstrate Ghana's preparedness, you know, to contain the um, threat of this Western Togoland um, irredentism and or secession and or whichever way that one may wish to put it. So the maritime domain presents insecurities around maritime piracy. And I think there is research evidence currently that piracy within the Gulf of Guinea has now surpassed that of the uh, Yemen, of the coast of Yemen and Somalia and so on and so forth. So there could be increasing attacks on oil tankers um, and host, you know, taking of hostages. There could be linkages between piracy and armed groups and given the location of our oil platforms, I think we all need to be concerned, although a lot of the oil is uh, in the Western region. All of this would have implications for loss of revenue and could fuel violence and insecurity that will result in mass casualties and so on and so forth. Because all of these will emanate from the threats in the maritime uh, domain. So Madam Professor, let me quickly conclude by saying that in reality, we've had only one episode of suspected alleged terrorism, characteristics of the way our governments play public policy or information policy. 
After 2nd June at Hamile, Ghanaians have not been told who that individual was, who was arrested. And I find that a bit uh, unfortunate. So we could risk uh, terrorism, which is rated very low, you know, but could, you know, spike, given the um, threats around our borders. Coupled with transnational organized uh, threats, these threats from a conflict analysis perspective could serve to heighten persistent increasing socioeconomic inequalities, marginalization, and relative deprivation in the northern border regions uh, of this country. And in the middle of high level uh, perceived corruption and abuse of power, I'm not saying by this government, but abuse of power by those who exercise power, uh, there could be repercussions, you know, from uh, a structural resilience uh, perspective. So from a structural resilience or vulnerability perspective, these insecurities from neighboring states could worsen the trafficking of drugs, small arms, and so on. Finally, they could also deepen the country's proximate risk, uh, including violent crime such as homicides and so on. And this in turn could worsen the nexus between the increasingly militant uh, illegal mining activities that we call Galamse in this country. I think it is empirically arguable that possible violent extremist organizations um, and the influx of illegal migrants, you know, small arms and so on, uh, could have serious implications for us. So I make a few recommendations, Madam Professor, given how intensely you're looking at me. That in addition to what General Kotia said, there is need to develop a national security policy, but not one that is done in some corner of the country, one that is consultatively arrived at, given that the government in power is only one segment of Ghanaian society, and what it perceives as the threats to Ghana's national security may not uh, be shared, you know, consensusly by the others. Besides military countermeasures, I have been arguing that we need to invest in measures against the causes of instability in a country, not to put guns and ammunition and so on in the military and leave the marginalization, uh, economic, social inequality, lack of participation, and so on and so forth. So by all means, let's enhance our counterterrorism capacity and vigilance. But let's also address the porosity of our borders. Because it doesn't matter what we do, if the borders remain porous, I think there could be serious uh, repercussions for us. So let's ensure protection of fundamental human rights. And I say this because of our tendency in the name of national security to abuse the power that the electorate have reposed in, in governments you know, of this country. And I'm suggesting that the government needs to weigh the option of directly participating in or supporting efforts elsewhere to counter terrorism than to wait as if the fire is not in Ghana and therefore it's not of a concern uh, to it. I thank you. And Madam Professor, please excuse me if I have. Thank you, Colonel. Colonel, the regret is mine that there isn't enough time to listen to these pearls of wisdom. But I'm certain that questions from the public will enable you to tell us more. Now, having situated ourselves in the world and in the sub-region, and having heard from our speakers that we are in a, a very unpleasant neighborhood. Let's come home. And if we are coming home, we want to start with small arms. The extent of small arms proliferation in Ghana 
and how to tackle it. This was supposed to have been delivered by um, Dr. Kwesienin, but he has sent a fitting representative. I've had cause to deal with Dr. Festus Urban in previous times, and I am not in doubt that uh, even if he's not first choice, his scholarship is of first rate um, standing. And so being a senior researcher, lecturer, and training facilitator at uh, KIPTC, he will be telling us all the stories about small arms. If you are in an unstable sub-region and you have so many small arms, then you are cooking for yourself a party, aren't you? Dr. Alvin. So, good evening, um, Professor Chairperson. I also want to stand on the existing protocols um, due to the time. Um, I would like to first of all thank the Ghana Academy of Art and Sciences for the presentation. And as Prof rightly said, Dr. Eni was supposed to be here, but due to some agent um, official duties outside the country, he asked me to represent him. So I'll try my best to represent him very well. So I would like to tackle my topic, which is looking at the extent of small arms proliferation in Ghana and how to tackle it. I will attempt to tackle this topic in three different forms. One, I will look at the extent of the problem in Ghana. Two, I will look at why, despite the several interventions, we've not been able to deal with this problem. And then lastly, I will provide some concluding thoughts about how to tackle the problem of small arms in um, Ghana. Now, when we talk about small arms, just for the purpose of those of us who um, perhaps don't know what small arms are. Um, when we talk about small arms, they are arms or weapons which are designed for personal use. And these are some examples of those arms. And when we talk about um, light weapons, they are designed for use by several um, persons serving in a team or as a crew. So these are also examples of some of these um, arms. Now in Africa, small arms have been described as, the, as Africa's weapons of mass destruction. Why? Because of its impacts on human security and also on um, development. In Ghana, small arms constitute the instrument used in internal conflicts which are motivated by identity issues revolving around land chieftaincy disputes and issues of armed robbery, carjacking, election violence, pastoral farmer header conflicts, and other violent crimes. Currently, we don't have an accurate statistics of how many small arms that we have in this country. But one of the statistics that we often depend on is the 2014 baseline survey that was conducted by the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center with UNDP and the National Commission on Small Arms. And the statistics shows that um, in 2014, we had about 2.3 million um, small arms and light weapons in this country. And out of these, we had 1.1 million that were illicit weapons, that is, those that are unregistered. Um, this was an increment from the 2004 um, baseline survey that was conducted, which had um, 
which had a, a total a total number of 220,000 uh, small arms in circulation, of which 125,000 were illicit weapons. That is those which were not um, uh, registered. I mean, if you look at the trend over the years, despite the fact that we don't have a current record of how many arms we have in this country, I'm sure most of you agree with me that the number would have increased looking at the volatile situation within our um, sub-region. But in Ghana, what are the different types of small arms and light weapons that we have? First are what we describe as the craft-produced firearms. And these are mostly produced locally by local blacksmiths across the country. Now, when you look at these local arms, they are one of the best within the sub-region, and they've been described as one of the most traffic across um, the country. And then we have the arms that are industrially produced, firearms, which are also found in some of Ghana's uh, markets and also flowing across the border areas. And some of these arms... Some of these arms include the handguns, the self-loading pistols, which are represented over, um, over here. These can also be found across, I mean, all the regions within the, the country. And then lastly, we have the improvised explosive devices, um, which include detonators, ammonium nitrates, and detonation courts, which are also trafficked from Ghana to other neighboring um, uh, countries. And in terms of the regional distributions, in the 2014 baseline survey, the northern region was one of the regions that had a lot of these small arms, um, followed by the Ashanti region and the Bono region and Greater Accra in that, um, in that order. We've been discussing small arms and light weapons for quite some years now. And the question that some of us keep asking is that why haven't we been able to win the fight against small uh, arms? And here I want to look at just some few of the reasons why we still have this uh, problem here. And I'll share some experiences from a field study that we conducted along the border areas of this um, country. So one of the first reasons why we continue to have small arms traffic into this country is one, the weak border management systems. I have always argued that if you look at how African states have developed or evolved from pre-colonial times, it's practically impossible for every country to maintain an effective presence in any part of the country. And Ghana is no exception. If you look at most of our border, I mean, areas, there are most of the places where you have lack of state um, presence. And Kenna Abwaji, I mean, spoke about that. And during the, during the field work that we conducted, we went to most of these areas and we saw a lot of areas that are totally, um, that totally lack the presence of states, I mean, officials like the immigration, um, customs, and the police service. So if you look at, sorry, the, the diagram is a bit small, but if you look at the um, northwestern border of Ghana, that is around the Bokun area, there are a lot of places that are unapproved routes used by armed traffickers. If you go to the, um, if you go to the southwestern borders, which is along the Cote d'Ivoire area, around Sampa area, you also find a lot of unapproved routes which are also used by armed traffickers and also drug um, traffickers and other smugglers too smuggle 
arms in and out of, of the country. And if you also look at the not, the not, um, if you look at the south, western part of, part of the country, you also find various routes of unapproved um, places where these arms are mostly trafficked from neighboring um, uh, countries. And so most of the arms traffic from these places have become very difficult, one, to record them, and also one, um, to really know where these arms are coming from. The second point I want to look at is the inadequate institutional funding and equipment for the agencies that have been mandated to deal with small arms in this country. And I'll take the first, the Ghana National Commission on Small Arms. If you look at the commission, one is more, its mandate is more advisory than being a regulatory institution. How can the commission deal with arms when it doesn't license arms, it doesn't regulate arms, and all these are done, I mean, by the police. The commission also lacked the needed resources and logistics to also implement its mandate and spread its offices across the regions of the country. And because of that, there are a lot of limited uh, visibility of its impacts across the country. When you take also the various security agencies that we find across the borders, most of them also lack the needed resources and logistics and modern technologies to trace, track, and detect movement of arms across um, the border. And when we visited some of the places, this is um, the border near Burkina Faso, the Hamley border. And one of the officers that we interviewed showed us these vehicles and asked, if you don't have sensors, if you don't have a gadget that can detect arms, how can you offload all these goods and check whether there are arms hidden somewhere? And those are the challenges that they face within um, the border, I mean, areas, coupled with the fact that there's lack of coordination and information sharing also between our neighboring um, countries. But of course, one of the issues that also came out was the complicity of some security officials in the smuggling um, enterprise. And this was something that was recorded in almost all the areas that um, we visited. The next point is the weak regulatory framework that we have. And I'll just quickly touch on one. When you look at um, the arms and ammunition legislation, one critical missing link is the fact that most of the local produce manufacturers are not recognized by law. And so most of the um, arms that are produced locally or the blacksmith work underground producing arms, which are sometimes traffic outside the country and also used within the country. And the next point is a volatile security situation that we find around us. Can I spoke about what is happening in Togo, in Burkina Faso, and in um, um, Cote d'Ivoire. And next year, almost all these countries are having elections, and Ghana is also having elections. And if you look at the proliferation of arms within this enclave, then it gives cause um, to worry. Coupled with the terrorist threats across the Sahel region and arms flowing from um, Libya through the Sahel to the coastal areas in West Africa, including, um, including Ghana. So how can we tackle this threat? I think most of the solutions to deal with issues of small arms in this country are already in the document. What we need is a um, political commitment to fund the agencies that are responsible for dealing with the threats. 
we also need to look at how we can partner with the border communities, especially those where we don't have a lot of um, state presence to deal with the threats. And then lastly, we need to also look at the preventive side of the problem by addressing the root causes of arms proliferation in this country by focusing on addressing issues of poverty, unemployment, social inequalities, political exclusion, and also change the way we do politics in this country from the confrontational kind of politicking to what the Rwandans have described as the consensual type of politicking, which promotes the general good or the general interest of the country. In conclusion, the very devastating effects of unregulated proliferation of arms highlight the agency with which action must be taken to address the problem. The need for the action is now, especially when the country and all of its neighbors prepare to go for elections in 2020, coupled with the heightened insecurity across the sub-region. I will stop here, and then um, if there are further questions, we'll deal with it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Festo Sobin. I'm certain you will get questions that will enable you to discuss the issues further. And so we are moving slowly into activities that pose a threat to us. And the next speaker, Mr. Paul Abraham Pamensa, is a senior programs officer at CDD, and he's going to speak on the topic vigilantism and gangsterism. I won't ask the source of your myth. I will only invite you to the podium. Thank you very much, Prof. And uh, I'll use greetings to also stand on the protocols. I was laughing because I thought Prof could do better in this topic than myself. Well, so um, when the topic was given me, I asked myself at which parameter do, do I limit myself? Because vigilantism and gangsterism, and with the current happening in the country, to the extent that we have had three official approaches to dealing with it, it's not a small topic. But I'll try and do briefly uh, what I want to do here is to establish the fact that security is a concern across board. And that's a kind of culture and other speakers have said. Uh, it's a worry uh, which globally or internationally we've uh, all acknowledged. Um, but the fear for Ghanaians is not the fact that uh, we are having increasing vigilante and cancerism in the country, uh, but the fact that we fear our security agencies will be invaded by these vigilante groups through politicization of our security. And two, we also fear because over the years we've not had consistency in dealing with issues of vigilantism. Uh, in 2012, we did a project with Kofi Annan Center to monitor violent related uh, uh, conflicts. After the project, we just had a briefing meeting with the security agencies. We just wanted to see how many cases of violence recorded in the elections and how many were tackled. Out of a lot, we had almost 98% that, that did not see the court or no actions taken of them, even though they were reported. So this is one of the fears, the, uh, the history of dealing with vigilantism in the country. Uh, and the third is also the fact that as uh, Festus has said, the proliferation of gangs and arms in the country also pose a threat to us that we need to deal with. But I, in my readings, I made three basic summary conclusions. First, I said gangsterism is not yet a feature in Ghana. We don't actually have matured, nurtured gangsters in the country. But we have all the conditions in the country that if we don't deal with them in future, we will have the gangsters as we have in South Africa, in the New York, 
city and all other countries that we have. Yes, vigilantism is, a, is prevalent in Ghana, but I also revealed that we also have what we call official vigilantism. Vigilantism that's perpetrated by our security agents, especially the Ghana Police Service. I conclude, also, I also have my third conclusion, summary conclusion, by saying that among all the causes of vigilantism in the country, lapses in the justice delivery system, perceived biases, are the causes, uh, one of the most causes of vigilantism in the country. I think we can discuss when it comes to the discussions. I give examples, one of the notorious vigil uh, gangsters in South Africa. We call them the numbers. And these are some of the operations that they do. Extortion, rape, inmate prostitution, murder, illegal gambling, smuggling, robbery, contract killing, drug and trafficking. And this is one of their leaders. These are the people, you arrest them today, they will come. When you look into the features of uh, uh, gangsters, they are established groups that have the resources, that have paved their way into the security agencies that can buy their way through the security. We don't have that in Ghana. We are not yet there. But as I said, we have all the necessary conditions that if you don't deal with it in future, we will nurture gangsters in the country. So that's, I won't go into the definition of gangsterism because I've already disputed that we don't have it in Ghana. These are some of the characteristics that we have. Among the causes that they give to gangsterism are these, for group identity, self-protection, pride, boredom, but the two theories that I read, they all base the most cause of gangsterism is money. That's the final world. So they have a cartel, the people who have the resources. And when you read the, 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 the theories, they are branded in three. They have uh, the core hard members, the fringe members, and the winner base. At best, Ghana can describe as we have winner base. The winner base are people who do the errands for the actual hardened uh, vigilante groups, uh, uh, gangsters. And in fact, in one of the interviews, trying to find out why people indulge in gangsterism. And the standing interview, this is what one of them said. Being in a gang means if I didn't have a family, I would think that is where I will be. If I don't have no job, that is where I will be. To me, it is a community help without all the community members. They will understand me better than my mother and my father. So that's the ideology, the frame of gangsters. They live by the day, they don't care about the future. We don't have that in Ghana. In vigilantism, I won't go into a definition, but I will say that any definition, in fact, when the first bill to parliament to pass the Act on Vigilantism came and I was reviewed, what I said is that any definition that simplifies what vigilantism is will miss the net. What I said in my office is that we rather need to define a criteria that when an issue falls within the criteria, then we can say it uh, befits a vigilante act. And because of that, uh, most of the theorists who do vigilantism classify rather than defining. So the first classification will be the tactics that the vigilantes use. So if it comes to the tactics of threat of violence, like lynching, mob attacks, that will be a first classification. If it comes to the soft attack, nonviolent issues, like what is used by the neighborhood watchdogs, that is also under classification. But more importantly, we have people who have also classified it in different means, whether it was spontaneously uh, taken or planned, or whether it's officially motivated or, or private. So we have private spontaneous vigilantism which is defined to be a group of bystanders who do not only arrest a wrongdoer, but instantly met out punishment to the person. That is spontaneous vigilantism. They are just citizens, they are not security agencies. They see something going wrong, they will arrest you, not process you through the courts. They will instantly met out justice to you. Then we have private organized vigilantism. That comes out of systemic frustration. People are in the community, they are frustrated, not only against the system, but also against the people who they perceive are wrongdoers in the system, but the system is not dealing with them. So they hatch a plan, monitor the system, and when an issue, they think an issue is going wrong, they will just tackle it. And it happens in communal conflict, chieftaincy conflict, language, they are all there, they are planned action. It's not spontaneous. Then comes official spontaneous vigilantism. It's a systemic application of force by the police service to deal with an issue. 
that, that's official vigilantism. Most often than not, they say it's a minimal force. But who defines what a minimal force is? And the resultant figures have not been uh, good. We all know in, the, in Ghana what happened at the six uh, Aswasi people who were killed in Mansun Kwanta. We know what happened at uh, Ofuasi, the new district creation where people were shot and killed. And as if we established a compensation package already, each of the group's uh, families got 250,000. So now I can see when uh, police people kill you, you get 250,000 Ghana cities in Ghana. It's an established package. So that's spontaneous vigilantism. And organized vigilantism by the official vigilantism is the one that we have the character and the structure within the police service. And, and those who followed the, Aswans, uh, the Kumasi case, after the, the, the forces invaded the court and freed their, uh, their colleagues. They followed up police people who went there. The fearful were prepared using the kennels and everything. And you know, we have the SWAT units there. We have all the prepared police service there who actually come up. It is a planned thing where rehearsed and they deal in the system when they perceive it, there's wrongdoing. In other instances, people, because it is very difficult to define vigilantism. They use theories to define uh, what vigilantism is. And uh, our own uh, Tankebe, he says that there are three bases at which vigilantism can occur. And the first one is ineffectiveness. I think first of said it, and can also said it. Ineffectiveness of the system to deal with the wrongdoing. Ineffectiveness of the system to actually create opportunities for people to feel free in their system. If people see that the system is ineffective, they plan their own way of compensating themselves and that people will easily support vigilante actions. The second one is perceived corruption in the country. If the people see that they are not getting what the system should provide for them, but they see people, the, 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 the development disparities are too wide, they find their way of catching up with other people and the vigilantism can okay. The third one is what is called right? <laughs> procedural justice. And in procedural justice, he defines it in three motives. One, procedural fairness, that's transparent manner at which justice is dispensed, equally among the people. Then distributive fairness is distribution of rights and resources across the country. But more importantly, Scotland gave five typology of how vigilantism can occur. He said, vigilantism can never occur if there is no identified wrongdoing in the system. And, and second, he says that, yes, they identify wrongdoing with there, but the state response to that wrongdoing will either make or not make people to also resort to vigilantism. The third one is that, yes, the action taken by people is a vigilantism, and that vigilante can create different types of vigilantes. It could be organized, spontaneous, and otherwise. And any vigilante actions also create victims. He says that in order to deal with vigilantism in a country, we must tackle all the five intercessions. The people who got injured must be compensated, if really, else they will also create another form of frustration that in another opportunity they will also retaliate. So there will be a circle of vigilante activities in the country. Secondly, the institutions that were expected to deal with the precipitating events, the, occur, the, the one that brought the vigilante activity, must also be dealt with. Not that people are vigilantes, the institutions that were expected to deal with the issue would not deal with it, but we don't tackle them. So he finally says that, any action that tries to tackle vigilantism in a country must tackle the five processes in the whole. You can't solve one and expect that you will solve vigilantism action. If people got injured, compensate them. If people faulted, deal. Let the justice system deal with them. If you fail in any of that, you can never solve vigilantism in a country. Because of the time, I was going to give the causes of vigilantism, but I'll shorten it. Uh, patronage, youth board with unaccompanied resources or uh, employment for them. And uh, we know the statistics of the youth employment, you say 13.7% uh, of our country uh, enter the job market and we have almost 250,000 young men entering the market every year. But the country or the uh, official institutions are able to employ only 2%, that's 5%. It means the remaining are their redundant. We also have other aided factors. Then we have the political factors, mistrust of the security services, mistrust of the electoral commission, especially on election related violence, mutual mistrust among the two leading political parties, proliferation and the seeming lack of control of the media landscape. 
vigilantism as a profession. Yes, now we have vigilantism as a profession. People who go to the gym train themselves and are always ready to offer their services to the highest bidder. So you can see a group of people who are indulging in langardism. You can go communal conflict, they are there. MPP can hire them, NDC can hire them. They are always prepared, they have trained themselves and they are ready to offer their services. We use a data to track the causes and the impact of vigilantism in the country. And this is what we have uh, for three tracking period. So when you look into uh, first half of Jan uh, 2018, you have the figures there, second half of 2018, and then this year, you realize that deaths out of vigilantism alone for this year is about over 80, uh, 80. And we have most of them caused by the police service. The total number of deaths caused by vigilantism is called by official vigilantism. I just gave an example of six people shot and killed at um, Mansoum Kwanta by the police service. I gave you examples of people who were killed at Fuase. I gave you examples of people who were killed at Krufu. They were all killed by the police service. So out of the 80 states, we have more of them being perpetrated by official vigilantism by the police service. This is the tracking indicators. Sorry, I mean, I'm just stating a fact. <laughs> this is a tracking indicator that we did over the three period. You realize most of the cases are happening in the greater Accra and Ashanti region, but our most worry as CDD Ghana uh, is the issue of uh, Fulani headsmen. Our concern is that when you look into the first track, it was up, then it came down. But just this year, it has gone up again. When we were tracking and we were trying to find why it slowed down in the second half of 2018, one of the reasons may be that um, the national security uh, adopted a ranching system where they adopted a large tract of land at the front plains and they have a project for keeping uh, the cows there. So our reason was that probably the ranching system might have subsided the flora and Nifama, uh, conflict. But in the first half of 2019, you realize that it's gone up. What is the cause? We're yet to find out. But we propose to the National Security Ministry to go out and find out what is causing uh, this factor that vigilantism is coming, uh, uh, Fulani Hesman conflict is coming back. So uh, these are some of the cases. So I won't go further. All that I will say is that we need to work on police ethics and professionalism. Consider publishing reported cases against the police service. That's one of the problems. Uh, we have an encounter with the police service, and they said they have ethical standards for which it's not every issue that they can publish. But I think that's also one of the perceptions that people will not go and report to the pips because they may not see the consequences. So we need to find a way for people to know that. We are not saying every reported case is, uh, the police is going to be found guilty. But I do the status must be known so people will not get frustrated. Redefine the concept of community policing. We believe uh, we, we, we need to, it's a good concept, but we need to redefine how it works. I believe it should be working with the communities, but not working in the communities. That definition must be clearly defined. We need to have a serious discourse on arms circulation in the country and management. Uh, first of all, says 220,000. I quoted 230,000. But if you look at between 2004 and 2014, the extent of increase of arms circulations in the country is about 850%. The extent of increase of arms circulation. The fact is that the, this figure, it says arms in the hands of adult civilians. So it means 18 years and above. And when we look at our population, it means at this 2.3, every Guinean has a gun. That's the implication. If you said 2.3 million arms are in the hands of adult civilians if you are taking out the security agencies then it means every Guinean has a gun we are not trained we don't know how it's uses we are frustrated and anything can happen we need to control that i suggest an establishment of an avenue that um, frustrated citizens or people who come into conflicts with the police service can go and report their cases and have a fair judgment. We propose an independent police complaint commission as against the PIPs. 
that people will feel confident that when I go, I go here, I will get justice for myself. I'm not saying that pips they don't have justice, but because people don't hear the outcome of pips investigation, they don't feel comfortable going there. So we propose an independent uh, complaints commission. Uh, so put together, vigilantism and gangsterism are the two most stretched security in internal security that we have. We need to tackle them to avoid any of unforeseen uh, challenges in our security system. Uh, official actions that have been taken, uh, the short commission, the vigilante acts, and the National Peace Council mediation actions must be completed and actions taken on them before 2020. We have more arms in circulation, people are already frustrated, there are antagonism among the two political parties, and if we don't take actions now, we may not be fortunate in 2020. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Abraham Pamensa, on vigilantism and gangsterism. I have heard a lot. None of it has changed my mind. So we go into some of the specific crimes that threaten our security and we will take a talk from Ghana police. This time, not the vigilante division. <laughs> the Ghana police um, is represented here by ACP Dr. Saeed Bugariba. We were expecting... Um, ACP, or is it DCOP? COP. Oh. He went up when I, while I wasn't looking. 